your seat, gentlemen, please. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Can you hear me at the back? Yes? Can you hear me at the back? That's better, right. I'm Mike Dudding, the organiser of the evening. So welcome uh, to the sixth memorial lecture uh, in this church. There should be 80 or so with us uh, tonight and another 40 on YouTube. May I start, this is the fun bit, with administrative points. There are escape doors where you came in and on opposite on the north side and there's a door up leading into the garden. The toilets on the right at the back as though you're going to the north door. At the end we have a Q&A session and after the last speaker has finished in the hall, questions will be taken from those on YouTube. This year, we're able to offer you a drink at the end of the lecture, but please don't forget the retiring collection, uh, which is in support of the church's ministry and mission, in particular for Ukrainian refugees on the way out. There is a, a simple card reader, if you've got one of those, or you can use the envelope in front of you as a gift aid uh, donation with cash. But whatever it is, please give generously. Could I ask you now to ensure that your mobile phones are turned off? And since the Reverend Nick Mottishead who is the priest in charge of this parish, is away conducting a funeral, I'll now ask the Reverend Tessa Bosworth, our curate, for a brief word, and she'll be followed by Colonel Jez Lamb, the area Colonel London, who will give the formal introduction to the lecture. But first of all, Tessa. Thank you, Mike. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. As Mike said, my name's Tessa Bosworth. I'm the curate here at Holy Sepulchre, and it's my privilege to welcome you here this evening. As well as being a parish church, a city church, and the National Musicians Church, we are, of course, proudly the home of the Royal Fusiliers Chapel. So it's wonderful that we're able to host tonight's lecture for you. You're always welcome here at any time to our services, Contemporary worship on a Tuesday lunchtime, choral worship on a Wednesday lunchtime, and Sunday morning services as well. To our lunchtime classical concerts, which have recently restarted on Thursdays. And even simply to enjoy this beautiful space and soak up some of the history. We hope you'll come back. Without further ado, I now hand you over to Colonel Jez Lamb to introduce tonight's lecture. Good evening. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to Holy Sepulchre for the sixth Royal Fusiliers Memorial Lecture. Obviously, these lectures are not spontaneous, so I'd like to congratulate the Royal Fusiliers Memorial Chapel Committee for their initiative in arranging the lecture we're about to hear. I would also like to thank the Reverend Nick Mottishead, who may be joining us later, for allowing us to hold the lecture here, and Sarah. Tessa and the staff for their cooperation in the arrangements. The Royal Fusiliers were formed in 1685 during the reign of King James II in the Tower of London as an Ordnance Regiment. Their initial purpose was to protect the guns of the Royal Train of Artillery and every soldier was armed with a superior pattern of musket called a fusil, hence the regiment's name. In 1689 the regiment ceased to be an Ordnance Regiment, becoming an Infantry Line Regiment 
and in 1694 was numbered the seventh of foot. Over the next 274 years, the regiment participated in most campaigns of the British Army with varying numbers of battalions. In 1785, His Royal Highness Prince Edward, later Duke of Kent and father of Queen Victoria, commanded the regiment in Gibraltar and Canada. The connection with successive Dukes of Kent has lasted to this day. In the 1850s, the regiment took part in the Crimean War, and in 1881, as part of the Cardwell reforms, uh, of which, in which the army was linked to various counties, the Royal Fusiliers was additionally designated the City of London Regiment. In 1949, its regimental headquarters moved back into the Tower of London, and then in 1968, the Royal Fusiliers merged with three other English Fusilier regiments, the Northumberland, the Warwickshire, and the Lancashire Fusiliers, to form today's Royal Regiment of Fusiliers, with its headquarters also in the Tower of London. The regimental chapel was established in the south aisle of this uh, church after the Second World War. The colours, memorial panels, kneelers and other regimental furniture ensure that our City of London connection is maintained. But with the majority of past and present members of the Royal Regiment of Fusiliers and its predecessor regiments living outside of London, the Memorial Chapel Committee wanted to ensure that our forebears were commemorated not just by inanimate objects but by people and events. This lecture is part of that vision. So I'm sure you'll have seen the flyer and the details of this evening's speakers. Their experiences in Ukraine date back to Soviet times well before the outbreak of the current conflict. Lieutenant Colonel James Sayer, who was to have spoken this evening, has returned to Ukraine to assist with the humanitarian effort, so is unavailable this evening. He has sent the following message. Having spent four years living in Ukraine, it is shocking to see the effects of the Russian invasion. Houses and streets where I used to live in Severodonetsk in Donbass have been destroyed, and even in Kiev, the situation is very volatile with the threat of airstrikes ever present. The Ukrainian people are very resilient, but their country is being destroyed by Russia, and the threat of out escalation outside Ukraine seems ever closer. When I meet my Ukrainian friends and see the stress and conditions they have to endure, I'm reminded of how lucky I am to live in the United Kingdom in peace and security. I'm personally very proud of the part Fusiliers have played in Ukraine in the days and years before the present conflict. In my tenure as commanding officer of the first Fusiliers, we deployed troops on several occasions to, to train the armed forces of Ukraine to defend against further aggression in the contested Donbass region. I doubt any of us seriously anticipated the scale of uh, the invasion that was launched against Ukraine in February. I hope our training reinforced the resilience of the exceptional defence we've all witnessed over the last few weeks. Captain Nathan Morley will describe his experiences of two of those operations. But before Nathan, we'll hear from Lieutenant Colonel Keith Kiddy, who first visited Ukraine in 1990, and I've just discovered that was the year before Nathan was actually born, and Colonel Simon Diggins, who worked with the Armed Forces of Ukraine and its Defence Ministry between 1998 and 2006. These two former Fusiliers, both of whom have served across the regiment's regular and reserve battalions, will bring to, bring to life Ukraine before the Russian occupation of Crimea and Donbass in 2014. We very much like to uh, look forward to hearing what you have to say. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, fellow fusiliers, brother officers. As was alluded to, um, I'm going to talk about the Ukraine in almost uh, terms of ancient history. I was fortunate to go to the Ukraine in June of 1990. Yes, it really was that long ago. The Berlin Wall had just come down, and I was the second in command of the 3rd Battalion Royal Regiment Fusiliers based in Germany at the time. Ukraine, as we know, was still a, very much part of the uh, Warsaw Pact and in the orbit of the Russians. Uh, nowhere near uh, an independent country as we would understand it today. However, as second in command of the 3rd Battalion, one of my other, uh, actually rather more amusing jobs, was that I was band president of the Duke of Kent's band. And of course, in those days, each regular battalion had its own band, so I was the band president. 
El Presidente. It has a, a lovely ring to it, doesn't it? And um, I took quite a lot of interest in the band. They were good chaps. Uh, the bandmaster, uh, Mr. Clark, uh, became a, a very good confidant of mine, and I was uh, one of the chaps who insisted that they, they did their other job, which was to be stretcher bearers and medics, which, given the June 1990 and what happened in 1991, it was fortunate. However, that's another story for another time. However, I was very prou proud of the Duke of Kent's band in that um, many bands at the time were um, not exactly dual purpose. Some bands could march and some bands could play, but not very many bands <laughs> could do both at the same time. But the Duke of Kent's band could. And I was idly sitting in my office one day. The clerk had just brought in my cup of tea and I was idly fumbling with a water biscuit when he rushed in with a signal, he said, sir, sir, you'll never believe this. And I said, yeah, yeah, that's right. So that, at which point I promptly didn't believe it because it was a signal from BOR which said, we wish to direct that a military brand go to represent the UK at a British trade delegation which will be held in Kiev in the Ukraine. And I looked at it and thought, Somebody's having a laugh here. No, nobody in their right mind would send a bee back to me. So I duly then went to see the CEO in a class. I said, um, excuse me, Colonel, I've just, you know, it's obviously some, some chum of mine's having a bit, of a bit of a joke, but I'll check it through. And I duly phoned up uh, one of the chaps in, in BOR, the old uh, program thing. I said, uh, I've got this signal here. So I said, you know, which idiot has sent me this? He said, oh, the Prime Minister. Oh, what a great idea. I think it's a fabulous move that we do this. So, it was, and it was a, a, a direction from Margaret Thatcher herself, who said she's going to Kiev, she wanted a British military band, she wanted the best there is. And luckily, we were the best there were. So, we, in conjunction with some people from the pipes and drums of the um, Royal Scots Dragoon Guards, because uh, let's face it, Everybody loves a guy in a kilt and a pair of bagpipes, don't they? So we put them all together with Mr. Clark, our bandmaster, in the overall musical lead, but we also had another chap called Major Rodney Parker, as he was later known, who was from the Army Musical Corps, who was to be seen as the overall director of music. I was duly designated as the OIC trip on the grounds they clearly wanted somebody to carry the can if it all went horribly wrong. So... All going swimmingly so far, we got the band, we got the band prepared, and then we were put on a C-130 Hercules and flew all the way from Guttersloe uh, through the enemy air defence <laughs> corridor and the rest of it, where we landed at Boris Paul Airport in Kiev, which I'm sure you've all heard of and are now well aware where it is. Um, I thought, well, this is you know, one of these things, and it was all going swimming until we got off of the back of the C-130, where we were met by a 60-piece band from the local um, uh, Kiev military district and met by Lieutenant General Gennady himself and his chief of staff, a guy called Colonel Sushin of the political directorate. What a lovely term. Hello, Colonel Sushin from the political directorate. I suspect he was probably in the KGB, don't you? But there we go. Anyway... It was all, all, as I say, all going absolutely swimmingly. We were all directed to the special buses, and we were put on special buses, where they then pulled all the curtains so we couldn't see anything. Welcome to Kiev. And then we were driven at very, very high speed with General Gennady's staff car in the front down the special avenues for the political apparatchiks, and which we were taken directly into the centre of Kiev having seen absolutely nothing on the, on, on the way. But, hey, that was the Soviet way of doing things. We arrived in central Kiev, and we were taken to our hotel, which was the Red Star Hotel. Sort of AKA the Union Jack Club. <laughs> but with the KGB on every level. Um, Apparently, they used to have Red Star hotels in every major city whereby military personnel in transit would automatically go to the Red Star Hotel. 
Um, military hotels, it did have a certain number of drawbacks in that, um, first of all, uh, they had no concept of military having downtime. So we were expected to be in uniform all the time because we were supposed to be recognized as soldiers, so forth. So, you know, the, the guys would carefully pack their sort of, uh, you know, wife beater t-shirts or whatever it was, shorts, whatever. no, in uniform the whole time. That's fine. The other thing about the hotel, it was again quite interesting in that um, the men were putting in, in, in multiple rooms, the officers, given there was only, only two of us, were given our own rooms, and I had the luxury of a television, which was great, until I realized it was probably going to be watching me rather more than me watching it, however. The other thing about the hotel, which again is uh, quite interesting, I'll come back in a moment, is that uh, two minor things is they didn't have any bath plugs for the sinks or the baths and toilet paper seemed to be in a rather sort of short supply but it's amazing what uses you can put to your field army notebook we were met a reception at the main door where i say my friendly kgb colonel sushin introduced us to the rest of the kgb and then we were escorted up, and it, on each floor of the hotel, there was a reception. So as you got in there, you were there, you were given your key there, and directed exactly to which room you're going to go to. So there was no question about. So they knew where you were every minute of the day. So that was all fine. The band, however, was there to do a job and did to perform in some actually quite impressive locations. Concerts were given uh, on many occasions in the open air, in theatres, in parks, at one stage in the Dynamo Kiev uh, Stadium, and at one point in the Naval Training College, which if you think is where Kiev actually is, uh, it's quite a long way from the sea, but actually the, the river in Kiev is very, very wide and they, a lot of do basic naval training there at the Naval College. Now the main event, the main event was on Saturday the 1st, uh, Saturday the 9th of June and this was to be at the trade exhibition site in central Kiev and uh, it was, uh, how can I put it, it's a bit like a county ground only on steroids. It was huge and all around it were these sort of big um, halls looking like sort of giant wedding cakes, you know, the sort of the Soviet Stalinist wedding cake school of architecture all around, which were then filled with really staggering, interesting things like tractors and more tractors. But, but that was what Mrs. Thatcher had directed that we'd come to do, and we were there to play for her and sundry other things and advice. However, we then had the usual business where military um, precision um, butts up against uh, trade bureaucracy. The trade delegation came out to meet me, because as I say, I was the fall guy. I'm standing there, band formed up behind me, the guys with the bagpipes, kilt, the works. And they said, um, we're not quite sure at the moment because um, the Prime Minister is um, deciding whether she wants to go and see the exhibits first or come round here first. Or go I, said, I said, well, the guys are here. What more do you want us to do? Uh, well, could you stand down for a minute because, um, you know, we're not sure. Okay, chaps, you stand down. About 20 seconds later, no, 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 it's all changed, it's all changed. Could, uh, stand up, boys, please, we're, you know. All right. Uh, she's going into the other side of, of the building. We're on the wrong side of the building. Okay, that's very simple. We're infantry, we'll walk round. How about that? Oh, thank God for that. We thought we'd have to get buses. No, no, we're infantry, we can march round. We'll march round away. But at that point, I had this sneaking suspicion that if we got our timings wrong, me leading the band majestically round the corner would be impacted by um, Margaret Thatcher and her team of security guys in the long stretch Zill limos coming the other way. So luckily, we managed to avoid that. I managed to get the guys round just as we saw Margaret Thatcher disappearing into the thing. So, okay, out they come again. Guys, you can stand down for a while. Okay, so we're so we stand and wait, and 
because anybody who's been in the army knows that actually they also serve who only stand and wait, and we did a fair bit of waiting. And then at that moment, yes, she's about to come out, she's about to come out. So, we're going to band for run. I nod to the bandmaster. He goes, they all team up. They start to play. Margaret Thatcher comes out. And I will, um, I will always remember this because she was wearing a, 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 a really rather fetching pink sort of ensemble. You know, it's not something where you, could, you normally expect Margaret Thatcher in, in sort of Tory blue, don't you? And stuff like that. But she was in pink. And she looked, waved, smiled and nodded at us got in the car and then disappeared. Total um, exposure to the band and the playing, about 37 seconds. <laughs> but we'd done it. We hadn't sort of uh, crashed into the car. We hadn't done that. We hadn't had an international incident. So that was all done. It was all great in 30 seconds. And everybody was absolutely delighted. It all went so swimmingly well. I then spoke to my good friend now. Colonel Slokin, who came up and he was all smiles and very, very happy. And I said to him, I said, um, it's very interesting, isn't it? You, you, this, this park, you've called it the park of the economic achievements. It's, it's, it's wonderful. I, I, I love it. I love it. Absolutely love it. I said, was it, did you call it the park of the economic achievements before the war? Or was it because you built it after the war? Because I know Kiev was really quite badly turned over during the war by the Germans. And he looked at me straight in the face and just laughed. He said, no, 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 we did it after the war. I said, really, why? He said, because before the war, we had no economic achievements. <laughs> so, uh, so we all had a bit, of a bit of a hoot about that, anyway. So the next day, uh, we were duly um, uh, taking him to central Kiev, where we were uh, formed up for a big parade and I'm sure when you've all seen Clive Myrie doing his, his bit, and then there's the sort of the, the big um, obelisk thing in the middle with, with the huge road. Well, we were formed up there in central Kiev um, on the Krestata, as it was, I think it was pronounced, with the Kiev military district military band, and God only knows why, hundreds and hundreds of Napoleonic War reenactors. And, you know, I look at and think, well, you know, uh, I know sometimes it's easy to sort of slip into sort of moments of, of reverie, and when you get to my age, you know, it's hard to work out where you are, but, you know, to have a 150-year time slip is, is, is slightly tricky. But there they were. They had the Russian regiments formed up, the French regiments, and very, very smart they were too. I will give them that. And so we all then marched down the central part of Kiev, and you can see, you, could, you know, you imagine the big, the big obelisk, and beyond it, you've got this sort of this uh, uh, edifice with a sort of uh, uh, an eagle thing on the top, and we're all there. And then we played the big final concert on the steps there, which was um, really quite, really quite, quite, quite interesting and, and, and quite memorial. The next day, we were due to fly back to Germany and back to back to home. For, hopefully, at that stage, teal medals. We haven't got it, haven't got it too badly wrong by that stage. And we'd all been taken to the airport, all waiting, and uh, the RAF didn't actually turn up. And I'm standing there with all these guys, plus the blokes with the bagpipes, and and, and our, our Soviet hosts, and uh, where's the um, I'm looking gently westwards, hoping that uh, I will see things. And then we get the message, terribly sorry, uh, aeroplane broken. Ah, oh, right. So we've got to go back to the hotel. Yes, we go back. So we're putting the buses with the, without the, with, with the no windows again. And again, to show just how good the, the Russians were, <laughs> as we got back out of the, uh, on the steps of the Red Star Hotel, Colonel Shukin looked me in the eye and said, welcome to Kiev. <laughs> so, you know, you've got to hand it to him. You know, uh, certainly, I, I, you know, some of the Russians do have a sense of humor. I can think of one who doesn't, but on the other hand, we have there. But, you know, in 
in just at that stage, what you've got to remember, walking around Kiev at, at, at that time, there was no concept of not being in the military. We were escorted everywhere. I had to be in my service dress, you know, full thing, full fig, you know, done that, walk, walked around. And there was no concept of downtime. And it was very interesting walking around Kiev at that stage when it was part of what I could only describe as what, what they called a, then a managed economy. And in that one stage, I looked in a shop and it was a... I can only describe it as a porcelain, a porcelain shop selling porcelain teaware and sundry other, you know, wonderfully good bits. It look, wouldn't have looked out of place in Meissen. So I thought, oh, that's interesting. So I said to her, can I go and have a look in here? Oh, certainly. Can you go. So we went in and had a look. And there was about 10 assistants. All right. But there was actually nothing on the shelves. There was quite a few things in the shop window, but there was nothing on the shelves. So I said, um, could, could, I, could I buy that teapot, please? Translated, da, da, da. no, you can't buy that teapot. Right, okay. Uh, could I buy that teacup? No, 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 you can't buy the teacup. Uh, this, is a, uh, this is a shop. Yes, it's a shop. Fine, um, but can I buy anything? No, you can't buy anything. Okay, are you open? Yes, we're open. So I, I gather that it was only certain people as her who managed to get this open. The other thing was that, um, how can I put it very, very carefully? You have to be very careful uh, when you get briefed. Now, the British military attaché was a wonderful guy, very pleasant chap, and he said to me, he said, Keith, General Gennady wants you to go and have supper with him. I said, right, sir. He said, now, Keith, three things. Three really, really important things. I said, right, sir. What? He said, don't get drunk. Right, sir. Don't be rude. Right, sir. And don't embarrass the British Army in any way. Right, sir. Well, some of you know me. This was a pretty high-risk strategy, wasn't it, really? I mean, yeah. Anyway, so cut long, so short. I get taken with one of our band, <laughs> one of our bandsmen round to General Gennady's house on the shore, on the lovely place, all in, and we then get to start being fed various bits and pieces. And I can only describe it as like having a sort of a meze in Cyprus. Little bits came out, we had little bits. And then, uh, tragically, he then opens a cupboard and out comes the vodka. And so we have the first of the toast. So it's a Red Army, Red Army. British Army, British Army. Well, after any number of those, it's Margaret Thatcher's handbag, <laughs> my dog, my dog, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I thought I, it was all going swimmingly until there was a great sort of commotion and a tray was brought out and on it was some of these sort of lumps of things which looked like fish, fish fingers but without the... Um, the bread crumbs on. So I'm offered one of these and I pick it up and it's all. So I see everybody else is putting a bit of salt on it, so I put a bit of salt on it and I start chewing it and I realise actually it's sort of unrendered pork fat. Great slab, slab of pork fat. And it's the traditional Russian thing, you eat that because if you eat that, it helps keep the vodka down so you can have some more vodka. So I'm eating this and I'm thinking, God, this is, you know, don't get drunk. Don't be rude, because if I throw up on his carpet now, this is going to be really pretty rude. And blah, blah, blah. So I'm eating this, and they're all busy munching away like this. And one of his flunkies come around and he goes, and he says, you like? I go, yes, I like very much. Go, they bring out another plate. So, you know, it's, oh my God, so I'm such a... So I managed to chew through this and, and not actually sort of completely disgrace myself, but getting back to the Red Star Hotel at silly o'clock in the morning just as the sun was coming up, feeling more shabby than a shabby thing. And I thought, well, looking at the time, I know what I'll do. I'll go have a shower, put on my clean shirt and stuff. And, you know, because if I lay down now, it'll be that index. So, you know. um, again, it's all going swimmingly. We're just in one of these parks. And I see out the corner of my eye, up comes the military attaché, the British military attaché, and I, you, know, you know that sinking feeling when you think, this is it. Oh dear. Oh dear. 
SO2 socks, Ross and Cromarty, here I come. Oh, no. And he came and said, um, Keith, I'd, I'd like a quick word about last night. Oh, uh, 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 yes, sir. Um, um, General Gennady's had a word with me. I said, oh, uh, uh, oh, could he? He said, yes. He said, he enjoyed your company so much, uh, he's invited you again for this evening. <laughs> the things I've drunk from my country, I tell you. However, so, that was it. In a slightly later time, in 2004, I was then commandant of the army training estate at Stanta, the Thetford battle area, which everybody knows and loves. And we received a request from the Ukrainian MOD, as it then probably was the Ukrainian MOD, to see if they could have a series of lectures from people about how to run a sustainable training area, because they got no real experience of it. And I, out of a cast of thousands, was selected because Stan to is seen as one of the premier training areas, along with a small team of people, an archaeologist, somebody who, who knew how to get rid of toxic waste, etc., etc., to go over to the Ukraine, da da da. Only this time, we weren't put on a C 140, we were actually put on a real aeroplane, flown into, oh yes, the Boris Paul Airport, where we were met by some very, very pleasant Ukrainian chaps who said, would you like to get on the bus? I thought, here we go. Time for the curtains to be pulled. But no, the curtains were opened. We were then driven around and people pointing things out. I thought, God, that's interesting. Never saw any of this before. Uh, and they said, we're going to take you to the hotel. I thought, oh, well, that'd be interesting. And when they did, stand up. Red Star Hotel. <laughs> and here we are some 14 years later, and they've still got no toilet paper or, to or plugs. <laughs> However, the first day we get taken to the uh, Ukrainian MOD where we had a, uh, gave a series of talks and lectures and, and asked, they asked sort of pertinent questions about how we run our training areas, how we don't run our training areas, etc. Et 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 and um, uh, at the end of that day we were then taken to one of their major training areas which is right by the edge of the Dnieper River where they do their major practicing for river crossings. And you know, our idea of a river and theirs is a quantum difference. It, it's huge, absolutely huge. And uh, it was very, very interesting. And, uh, you know, the, the, the difference between the sort of the Russian approach to, to a visit like this and the Ukrainian was very different. They were very welcoming and very interesting. But then to our surprise, the next day they said, well, um, we've got a bit of a problem in one of our training areas. We'd come down and have, have a look. And I thought, yeah. Oh no, we were taken to the airport, put on a plane, and flown to Sevastopol in the Crimea. So we're in the Crimea, and I thought, oh, yeah. and we're taken to a, a training area just just down the way from a little place, which I'm sure you've heard or all heard of, called Balaclava. It was amazing. So we're all in Balaclava, Balaclava Harbour, and it just so happened that there was an exhibition on at the time about the Crimean War. And I thought, well, this could go either way, chaps, couldn't it? And so I just mentioned to, to mine host about uh, uh, the great war record of the Royal Fusiliers, the 7th Fusiliers, and, and how they fought in the Crimea and in Sevastopol. And he was delighted. And I got dragged in to this museum where I was then asked to do an impromptu talk about the British involvement in the Crimean War. Um, all I can say, it's just as well as I'd read the Flashman novels. Yeah. <laughs> so, there we go. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, they, 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 they couldn't have been happier. But, um, as I say, I got, on, I got on terribly, terribly well with this, this, this guy, and he was so pleased. We then went back to Sevastopol and had a look around and bits and pieces, and he said to me, he said, um, well, we've got a bit of time spare, a bit of time spare, maybe we'll fancy doing something this evening. I said, oh, yeah, okay. Hoping it wasn't going to be another General Gennady lumps of fat epic. He said, no, no, no. Do you want to see the Black Sea Fleet? I said, oh, yeah, okay. So we get in a Land Rover equivalent, and we drive through the huge shade wages, and we're now driving up and down the dockside, and the Russian, entire Russian Black Sea Fleet is tied up in Sevastopol. I'm looking at it again. Wow, look at this. Look at, you know, who would have thought it? He then says, come on, I'll show you something really special, really special. And we went into a place, and it was, it was seriously about the size of this, this church. And it was a giant swimming pool. And I looked at this, and I thought, oh, that's unbelievable. 
all these under underwater bits and pieces, obstacles and things. And I said, oh, this is interesting, you know. Um, oh, uh, what do you do this for? And he then got, and he went on the side of the pool, and suddenly this dolphin popped up. <laughs> Flipper, the dolphin. Come on, come on, there he is, Flipper. And he says, well, you like this? So he then gives me this bucket of herrings or whatever. Oh, so things like that. Oh, so another couple of... Oh, oh. Oh, he's off and he goes round this... Oh, I said, this is marvellous, this is marvellous. Yeah. Up he comes again. Oh. Another couple of herrings. Fantastic. And he's off again. I said, I said this is amazing. Well, you know... Slightly odd place to be running a sort of a, a zoo or an aquarium. He says, no, 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 no. You, you must be, it's not a zoo. These are killer dolphins. I said, what's your killer dolphins? He said, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He said, we train them to recognise enemy frogmen. And then once they can work out all the obstacles, we can let them out. They go around the bottom of the Black Sea Fleet. And anybody who's not supposed to be down there, they'll kill them. He says, how do they do that? He says, I'll show you. He took me in another little room, and you've all seen the Russian gas masks, the Schlem gas mask. You, 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 well, they've got a little hood for the dolphin, which you put it on, and there's a plug of light up the top of it. I said, well, do you know something? To that day, nobody's ever believed me. <laughs> but however, in my defence, in last week's Daily Telegraph of last Thursday, trained dolphins to protect Russian ships in Black Sea. <laughs> Fact. So I hadn't overdone the vodka before I'd gone into, you know, it's true. It's true. So, you know, we <laughs> the difference, though, to be brutally honest, at that stage, the Ukrainians were very, very open and lovely people and very pleasant to work with. They seemed very proud of their heritage and they took a lot of time taking me and my team into places like uh, the wonderful cathedrals, which they've got in, in, in Kiev and, and in, in Sevastopol, that you know the ones with the great golden domes that they've spent a lot of time refurbishing and still obviously very highly, highly religious and, and, and well motivated. The trouble is, at that stage, in 2004, they still hadn't got beyond the, 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 the old Soviet orthodoxy. And, of course, after sort of what have you, they seemed rather much more, more like a sort of a, a, an, enthusiastic, an enthusiastic militia than a proper army. Now, you'll hear more about the change of that in a moment. But at the time we were there, it was the time of what they've called the Orange Revolution, when discontent was in the air about the government, who was running what, who was doing what to whom, and what have you. And uh, when we got taken out for a drink in the evening into the pub, you could, you could actually feel the sort of the discontent and the, and the, sort of the, the general sort of feeling it was quite palpable, and you knew something was going to happen. And then that all kicked off in the November of 2004 and that then set them on the path to which we now have ourselves and as I say um, I enjoyed my time in the Ukraine on both times I enjoyed my time working with actually the Russians and the Ukrainians I didn't enjoy the headaches or the hangovers but as I say I did it for my country so that's it thank you for listening Um, as always with Keith, it's kind of follow that, so I'll do my very best to, to, uh, to, to, to do that. Um, thank you for the opportunity to pass on some of what I learned, some of my encounters with uh, Ukraine and the Ukrainians. And I hope from what I say, you may be able to draw some conclusions, some thoughts, some observations, which maybe just illustrate a little bit about some of the challenges we're facing today as well. Uh, as I spoke to one of you of you at the beginning, though, a lot of that kind of conclusions and observations comes in retrospect. At the time, the experiences were very profound, 
They were very um, marked. There was something I really didn't understand. But in retrospect, looking back now, I can perhaps see some patterns that I didn't see, see before. I'm going to talk about three, three encounters. The first was when I was teaching at our staff college, and we hosted the first ever visit of the Ukrainian staff college in 1998 to us here. The second was when I was sent, a couple of years after uh, Keith was sent to look at the training areas, I was sent to help the Ukrainian Ministry of Defense to reform their, um, their HR department, and indeed the whole way which they looked after human resources, the people of the, of the, of the Ministry of Defense. And the third one really is something that you've all been involved in, you'll see, um, some little involvement I've had uh, with trying to provide some support to Ukrainians recently, all of which I think may have some relevance from there. But first to the, um, to the, uh, the, the staff college and everything went with there. Um, it's one of those classic things where this, the Ukrainians coming to our staff college was not seen by us perhaps with the same significance as the Ukrainians saw. Um, so we were, we were led, the, the Ukrainian delegation was led by a very senior general. In fact, he turned out to be the, the, the airborne regimental commander who had captured Kabul in 1979. Uh, and he was the core, by then he was a core commander in the Ukrainian armed forces. And like all of those individuals, intensely proud of his service with the Soviet armed forces. So even now, the, the, that, if you like, that origin group, the Soviet armed forces are split into the Russians, Belarusians, or the Ukrainians, intensely proud of their service with them and what he was doing. And very interested in what we thought we were doing. I'd love to know what he thinks about our recent adventures in Afghanistan. But he was very clear about what they'd been involved in and which worked and what didn't work from, uh, uh, from, from there. What struck me, though, was that the, um, how direct they were. If they wanted something and they wanted it, they wanted to be really clear about it. At one stage, we had a visiting minister come across to the staff college from Ukraine as well, and he was giving a presentation. Uh, and Keith's being very polite about our Royal Air Force friends. Well, the staff college at the time, the administrative staff there were also Royal Air Force. There are any Royal Air Force in, the, uh, in, the, in there? Anyone? Look, well, there's, everyone's keeping their hands down. Very sensible. Well, unfortunately, the, this particular occasion, the minister was giving a speech, very full speech, very passionate speech, full of explaining how the world had changed. We'd moved on. We weren't Soviets now. We were Democrats. This is 1998, 1999. Um, and this RAF corporal, God bless him, uh, decided to mess around with electronics. He decided this is the precise the moment and administered the most profound bit of the minister's speech to adjust the microphone, adjust the loudspeakers, and do all this. I know, sir, you're not going to do that to me, but that's, that was what he was, <laughs> that's what he decided to do. At which point the minister exploded. It's the only way I can describe it. And we're in, in, a, in a place of God, so we'll not use the words which he used. But if you can imagine all the worst swear words which we, we have, the minister used those. Now, he said it, of course, in Ukrainian. But we're all listening with our headphones on to the interpreters. So we got this real blast of good old-fashioned Anglo-Saxon in our ears. And my goodness, we all woke up on that, on that occasion. And I was, I was humiliated. I was like, oh, my goodness, because you know, I was the project officer for this particular visit. So I spoke to the interpreter after and said, what, what, what's happened? And he said, well, the, you know, clearly he was very irritated by this particular corporal. And I leapt across the room to drag this corporal off the, off the, off the electronics and leave the, leave the stuff alone. But he said, what you've got to remember about the Ukrainians, he said, you'd also fight the Russians. They are really direct. If they want something, they say it, and he said it exactly. And the fact that he was the minister, and the fact that it was the Soviet, it doesn't matter. You're going to get it hot and sorry, straight from them. And we did. We knew exactly what they wanted from, from there. They were trying to rebuild their army. They were trying to rebuild the way which they thought about business. They were trying to imagine themselves as a different sort of organization. We did what soldiers have done through the, through the generations. We did exchanges of badges, exchanges of, of, of bits of uniforms, so they could have ours and they could whatever. live there. And at one point, one of the, the, the British soldiers ran out of stuff to give, but the Ukrainian was still handing stuff out. And, and there was a sort of, mm, we haven't done a proper exchange here. And then the, the, the Ukrainian, very magisterially, very, very, very correctly said, we are officers, I can trust you, it's gonna happen. And indeed it, it did. The officer then went to make trouble to make sure the Ukraine got the badges in retrospect from there. But it was very much a sort of, you know, we're not the Soviets. We are officers. We have an officer core view of life. And that's how we're going to, we're going to be different for the future from, uh, from, from there. So I, that experience to me was, was um, both very enlightening and also it had, it had its lighter moments. The core commander, the lovely man who'd been the airborne regimental commander in, in Kabul, um, 
arrived with two suitcases. Suitcase number one was his normal suitcase that had all his, his clothes in. Suitcase number two contained a large collection of um, vodka, black bread, and sausage. Because, and this is the thing, because his, his wife was a fan of Charles Dickens. She had read all of Charles Dickens' novels, and she knew them in detail. And she knew there was new f no food in Britain. Uh, and so, every, I had to, I, I, so uh, we had dinner, uh, and then the general, the interpreter said, the general wants you to, to come, and, come and have a, a glass of vodka with him. I said, that's fine. So we went up to his room, there's about eight of us in his room. This suitcase opened up, completely full of stuff from there. And then we then had basically a second meal. He said, because he said, I cannot take this home. My wife will be really upset with me if I take it home from there. At that point, um, I then had to find myself a room in the mess that night because I really couldn't, I really couldn't get myself home. Uh, and the following day, I then booked myself from the remainder of the visit and said, I'm going to be living in the mess for the next four days because I will not be coming home for four days. So my family didn't see me for four days because there was no way I was going to make it back from, uh, from there. But a, a, good, a, good, a good visit from, from, from there. Um, real pride, very clear about what they wanted, um, and just starting to see how they're going to move forward from there. The second visit was, my second encounter with them was when I went to, uh, I was asked to help change the way in which they did their personnel systems, change their, the way they did their human resource systems. Because I think people like Keith who'd been looking at training, we, by that stage in 2006, we now had uh, Ministry of Defence personnel actually embedded in their Ministry of Defence and said, nothing's really going to change until not only we change the operational side, but we change the way in which they organise their, 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 their structures. And the key thing really was that Promotion to a senior rank in the Ukrainian armed forces at that point was not just about your operational competence, but essentially you then became a kappa. You had access to patronage. You could, you could sort out people's houses. You could make sure they got promoted. You, but you had, you had all this patronage at your control and at, at your, and under, your, under your fingertips. And the difficulty with that was that there, there was no transparency to the system. It wasn't fair. Um, and really what happened to, that mattered was, you know, did you get on well with a senior general or not? Because if you didn't, you didn't get promoted, you didn't get a decent house and everything went with. And we were trying to make that better for, for them. So a team was put together, a British team and a Ukraine team. The Ukraine team was led by a, um, a, a Ukraine Air Force officer who commanded a backfire regiment. Those of you who are, are, are military or ex-military know what the backfires are. They're strategic bombers, they're nuclear bombers. So he'd be commanding a nuclear bomber regiment. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the Soviet days, but he wanted to reform things. He wanted things to change. He wanted things to be better for the, for, for, for the, for the future. And because at that time, the Army's personnel center was up in Glasgow, when they came across on their first visit to us, we arrived, they arrived in Glasgow, uh, where they were greeted by Gaelic. So if you ever come to arrive at Glasgow Airport, you don't see anything in English, or even in, in, in Lance. And it was a, the first time it was a Kied Mielfied. And they'd arrived with an interpreter, who was a brilliant interpreter, who we got to know quite well, who spoke French, English, German, uh, Spanish, but sadly she didn't have Scots Gaelic. And so when she saw that there, her, her face just completely dropped. And she said, I don't understand. I said, don't worry. Most people in this country don't understand, but it means 100,000 welcomes. So here's 100,000 welcomes. So we got them from there. And they were cold. They'd arrived in Glasgow, um, and, in, and for some reason they'd, they'd arrived in, sort of in, in you know, what they thought was well wrapped up clothes, but they were cold. So the first thing we did was buy them all scarves um, in, in, the, in, in a tartan. There was a big question about what tartan to give them. I said, there's only one tartan I'm afraid they're going to have. It's the Black Watch tartan. Um, it's, the, it's the soldier's tartan. So they all then left, all ten of them, wrapped up in Black Watch tartan for, to take themselves back to there. So I don't know, Nathan may tell us that's now a regiment in, 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 in the Ukraine all wearing a Black Watch tartan, but if it there is, it started here with, with, that, with a visit from, uh, from there. The general was clear, though. He was in charge. Some rather foolish young officers at the Army's personnel center in Glasgow, um, because I was a sort of senior British officer in, in, the, in the group, when they were briefing, they were briefing me. And I kept saying, brief the general. And it was brief the general. And he was getting more and more irritated by it. So we had to stop the meeting, get them all out and say, listen, the guy who's in charge is a general at the far end. You talk to the general. You do not talk to me. OK, sir. And they all carried on nicely from there. But that was a, there was a sort of de delicate moment of tact before we, got the, uh, before we got the protocol right on, 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 on that. And then we did a reciprocal visit. We went over to Kiev. And that, for me, was really, I think, when my attitude towards Ukraine, Ukraine has completely changed. Because I went to this extraordinary city, 
Uh, and you know, it horrifies me seeing, as always horrifies me when I see a town that's been, that I've known being bombed and attacked. It's actually a very beautiful city. And I hope in the years to come, some of you may have the opportunity to go, go and visit it. It's very beautiful. It's a very European city. It sits above the Dnieper, the river Dnieper. And when we first arrived, it was November, but it was still people out. It wasn't a particularly cold November. Uh, they have these lovely terraces above the river there, and they've got wine gardens and cafes and everything that goes there. It feels like a southern European town. Um, it really did feel lovely. It felt a very great place to, 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 to be. And then we carried on with our, 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 our exchange of information and ideas. And this is where you start to see some of the challenges that Keith alluded to, which we're also hearing about the, what happened in Ukraine between about 2004 through to about 2019. Because it was really clear that what we were offering them in terms of changing the way in which they did their HR structure, their personnel structures, was deeply challenging because it was going to challenge all this patronage. It was going to challenge the old way of doing business. And about two-thirds of the way through this, 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 this exchange of ideas and reform uh, program that we put them, it all came to a grinding halt. And it came to a grinding halt because my interpreter um, started shouting at, um, at a group of, of full colonels and brigadiers in the Ukrainian armed forces. Um, and you know, normally you expect interpreters to interpret what you've said. But she got so angry with them and so uh, frustrated by their, their, their unwillingness to bend, that there was, there was literally like a five minute tirade from the interpreter to them, explaining really what, he thought, what she thought of them and that how they needed to change their attitude and change the way in which they, they, did, they, they, did, they, they did the business. I was then in shock again. So we had to stop the meeting, went out there, and then I said, a couple of things. First of all, to, to you know, bring the interpreter back on side and just say, you're here to interpret for me, not to, not to explain your political views but thank you for doing that. And then the kind of leader of the kind of the stick, stick as we are faction then came out and said, hmm, he said, he said, sometimes emotion works, isn't it? I said, yeah, sometimes emotion works. And from that point onwards, we moved the thing onwards from, uh, from, from there. And then there was the vodka. Um, we had had an incident in Glasgow where we'd been all sitting down for dinner and we'd ordered a bottle of wine to have a couple of glasses for, for everyone there. And then a couple of, the, uh, a couple of the, the Ukrainian officers were looking a bit thirsty uh, their glasses have been emptied rather, rather, rather quickly. But the Ukrainian general said, and he said, we are not Russians. And that was, uh, look, that was it. So that was the end of the drinking for the evening. But at the end of my session in, in Kiev, though, I, I went, I was invited out for dinner, where, for, and this is, you know, it sounds horribly cliched. Uh, I had, I think, my fourth chicken Kiev. Of, of, <laughs> I had a lot of chicken Kiev in Kiev. Because um, everywhere I went, oh, you must try King Kiev. Yes, I must try King Kiev. So I must try Chicken Kiev. And we had, oh, more Chicken Kiev. Fantastic. So it all went very well from there. And then we came to the toast, which were, as Keith said, there was vodka was, was involved. And the first ones were to, uh, to Her Majesty the Queen, to the President of the Ukrainian Republic, and all of those. And then they, they, they started to um, become slightly more jocular. And then I made the mistake. I sort of stood up and said, I just said, I, you know, because I, I genuinely, for the first time, it's now 2006. You know, we're, we're a long way now from the end, of the end of the Cold War. But for the first time, I suddenly stopped thinking of them as the enemy. It took all that time for me to suddenly to get out of my mindset, get that Cold War mindset out of me. They're, not the, they're no longer my enemy. They are my friends. I'm going to work, work with them. So I said something on that time, and I made a toast you know, to amity between the British and Ukrainian peoples, which they all happily toasted. And I thought that was going to be the end of it. Oh, no because I'd made a serious toast. So every you find yourself in Ukraine, do that, and, you, and the toast start to decline, and we get into the Margaret Hatcher, Thatcher's handbag uh, stage, fine. You're on, a good, you're on the way out at that point. If you then decide in your cups, oh, I'm going to raise the tone again and do something really, really profound, beware, because having raised the tone again, you're back into another sequence until they get back down to Margaret Thatcher's handbag all over again. So watch out, watch out, as they say, if you, if you ever do toast with the, uh, with the, with the Ukrainians. And the last one really, I think, is, is, is really where we all are now. I think we've all watched what's happened with utter horror. Uh, and it's not the place here tonight to talk about what's motivated Putin to do what he's done, except to, perhaps to say that he, he clearly he's not mad and he's not irrational. He clearly has a different view of how the world is and should be and his own view. View. And he's, he started with the Ukrainians, so the people who he doesn't understand are actually a very different and a very distinct people from there. Uh, we've all been horrified. A friend of mine who uh, I work part time for the NHS, but a friend of mine is actually a Ukrainian, uh, Professor Dennis Ochran, who works in children and adolescents mental health services in East London. 
Um, and he just got his professorship, literally, I think at the beginning of the year in, in January. And then Putin invades on February the 24th. And since then, until literally about two or three weeks ago, Dennis has been, has been taking medical supplies over to, um, to the border. Uh, he's been asked by, actually by the defence attaché here, the Ukrainian defence attaché, not to cross the border, otherwise he has to then stay in Ukraine. But what they're doing instead is uh, they've kept on promoting him. So he was, um, he was a professor of children and adolescent mental health services here in East London, and he was a reserve lieutenant in the Ukrainian armed forces. He's now a general in the Ukrainian armed forces as a result of what he's been doing. But he's been doing an absolutely remarkable job. Uh, and it's been my, my privilege to, you know, if he's unsure which buttons to press in our, in our wonderful system, uh, where, he could, uh, where he could get some help and some assistance. Um, I think we've done a really good job in terms of what we're doing. We've made our decisions about what we are going to do and what we're not going to do in terms of red lines, um, but there's still more to do. And where this is going to end, I don't know. All I will ask, and please, for all of us, please, is not to forget the future. I mean, we, the last calculation I saw suggested that the amount of damage that's been done to Ukraine, that's not even talking about the, if like the current account, but just the sheer damage in terms of infrastructure, is well over $120 billion already. I mean, it's staggering. It's absolutely shocking. We've got a quarter of their population who are refugees. Uh, again, staggering figures. You know, imagine 15 million people. That's the equivalent of, uh, of uh, in, in, in UK. The very large number of them are, are women and children, very vulnerable, very shaken, very scared. Uh, and so my last request really for all of us, and we've all seen what's happened, is that you know, whatever, whenever this war finishes, and it will probably be an ugly and messy finish, let's be honest about it, but when it does finish, let's not forget the reconstruction. Let's not forget our Ukrainian friends. And you know, when, they, when they turn around to us and say, actually, we need you know, X million pounds to, to, to sort these things out, uh, we remember them and we continue from there. But thank you for your time. And on And I can now hand over to, to, to Nathan. Nathan's the regimental adjutant for the Fusiliers, so uh, he's going to keep us all in good order. So, Nathan, over to you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm going to start with an apology in that uh, my speech has exactly zero references to killer dolphins, Napoleonic soldiers, uh, or tartan sort of scarf-wearing Ukrainian soldiers, but um, I'll do my best. And I'm going to talk about the context in which the 1st Battalion deployed to Ukraine in 2017-2018 on Operation Orbital. Um, so as I said, I'm uh, Captain Morley, the Regimental Adjutant, so I work in the tower getting shouted at by Colonel Denny on a daily basis. And I was previously the 8th Platoon Commander in Y Company 1st Battalion, where I was shouted at by Colonel Lamb on a daily basis, which makes me think I might be the problem. But um, by way of some context for the deployment of First Fusiliers on Operation Orbital in 2017-18, from the beginning of March 2014, demonstrations by pro-Russian and anti-government groups took place uh, in the Donetsk and Luhansk regions uh, in the east of Ukraine, together commonly called the Donbass. The self-declared Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics took over the local government and the fighting between the Ukrainian forces and pro-Russian forces began. The fighting in the Donbass region at the time was best likened to First World War trench warfare uh, the occupation of networks of static trenches were typical uh, of the role for both sides of the conflict. There was mining and demining activities using both conventional and unconventional munitions. Uh, and this was common in the area of uh, no man's land between the two lines, as well as the presence of frequent uh, recce patrols, sabotage and the heavy presence of snipers. Operation Orbital began in 2015 to deliver life-saving defensive skills, in effect, to the combat troops of the armed forces of Ukraine. It now operates alongside more than seven NATO partners, delivering tactical and operational level training support and advice. And so on to the Fusiliers. Um, I know that many of you might be hoping, given what we've seen in the news, that I'm gonna tell you how we spent our months handing out missiles and training them how to uh, destroy the Russian tanks. But much like I do to uh, Colonel Denny and my parents, I'm going to have to disappoint you because that was not quite the mission brief at the time. As a platoon commander in Y Company 1st Battalion, we were deployed on Op Orbital to Ukraine as a short-term training team in support of the UK mission there, first from uh, June to August 2018 and then again from October to December in 2018, so about six months. On both deployments, Operation Orbital was conducted under the concept of training the trainer 
uh, enabling the Ukrainian military personnel to pass on the techniques initially being taught to them by us uh, through our UK program. At the company level, we were focused on the build element of Operation Orbital, to build the armed forces of Ukraine operational capability and capacity through targeted training, deliberate support, mentorship and advisory capabilities. And this was focused primarily on the operational forces and fighting capabilities of uh, the armed forces, but with a keen eye on long-term sort of institutional change as well. I could go on for hours about the detail of the training uh, and sort of stories about bits and pieces of the training over those six months uh, and the relationships, etc. Uh, but you yeah, know, don't quite have the time to do so. Um, so what I'll do is talk in brief about both of those deployments, where they differed, and some of the things that I personally learned, and I think that we as a battalion and as a company also learned. Uh, and, and much of my thoughts here echo exactly what's already been said about the nature and the character of the Ukrainian people. So the first deployment for Y Company was to Zhitoma, which is in the sort of north of the western half of Ukraine, not far from the Belarusian border and uh, Chernobyl. Um, and this was the third subunit deployment, actually, for the first Fusiliers, but uh, sorry, third subunit deployment for the first Fusiliers, the first one for Y Company. Uh, you may have seen in the news that Shatoma has been subject to recent heavy shelling, uh, and indeed the training center where we were deployed, stayed, and delivered our training has since been destroyed uh, and sort of raised to the ground. For this particular deployment, the training, uh, the training package was delivered to about 215 armed forces of Ukraine soldiers and officers from across their Air Assault, Air Assault Forces Command and included specifically uh, additional medical training, infantry and survival drills, countering improvised explosive devices, training for defensive operations in an urban environment, countering attacks from snipers, armored vehicles and mortars. And this was achieved through five different courses, a junior non-commissioned officer development course, the reconnaissance soldiers course, an urban defense course, an enhanced combat first aid course, which they specifically requested, and a land survival course. Of course, I can only focus on the training that I was sort of responsible for in particular, but I do have a broad uh, sort of understanding of the day-to-day -day content of some of the other courses, um, should there be any questions about them later. My responsibility uh, for this deployment was the delivery of the 10-week junior NCO training courses, or the CARDAS, designed to improve low-level soldiering uh, amongst the Ukrainian soldiers, such as the ability effectively judging distances and communicating them, giving clear and concise target indications, understanding and implementing clear control measures at the platoon and section level, amongst others. This delivery was made through the overall management of the course by myself and the platoon sergeant and the structure. So we did the tactical elements, some of the leadership and mission command pieces with the section level and low level soldiering skills delivered by the section commanders alongside a section of demonstration troops drawn from across the company. The intent was also to instill some kind of understanding and the value of mission command, i.e. empowering your subordinates to make decisions on the ground amongst their junior leaders, uh, which we actually met with very, very stiff resistance by the Ukrainians from the outset. I think there's perhaps an era or an element of a Soviet era hangover uh, of a very centralized command structure where the decision making and responsibility for all of the kinetic decisions and actions on the ground are held very much at the sort of platoon commander or senior command level. Uh, and although they do have a senior non-commissioned officer uh, sort of cohort amongst the army, this has only been recently introduced. And the Western concept of non-commissioned officers being empowered and being leaders in their own right, displaying initiative and taking decisions is often not seen. Previous short-term training teams from the Fusiliers have found that the Ukrainian junior non-commissioned officers won't really see themselves as anything other than just senior soldiers and therefore often shirk any kind of responsibility. This reliance on officers in practical terms uh, and you know, within a training context often meant that you found yourself talking to an interpreter who would then have to talk to their officer who would then have to deliver whatever the message was to the soldiers. You can understand how much time that takes up. And when you translate it to the battlefield, of course, it, it sort of cause, uh, causes an immense amount of stagnation. It is one of the elements that we sought to address, and it was within the mission brief, and time will tell whether it gets taken up on any larger scale. Though a few months is, of course, not enough to drastically change 
this. Uh, I do think that at the lower level, amongst the more junior soldiers, you know, the post-Soviet era soldiers and officers, they did see the value in empowering their lower level leadership. And I think this was demonstrated some incredibly strong performances that we saw during the courses that we delivered, but also some of the reports that we've had back since in terms of the fighting that's taking place throughout Ukraine. The second deployment for Y Company from October to December 2018 was to Rivna, again in the northwest, and again recently subjected to heavy artillery and suffering some of the worst single event casualties uh, in the war in Ukraine thus far. The intent this time around was to generate a new cohort of Ukrainian instructors who would be centrally based at a brand new training center and they would deliver mission specific training to Ukrainian soldiers as they came out of and were reintroduced to the Donbass area where the fighting was taking place. Across the company, instructor training was delivered across a number of areas, live firing and marksmanship, reconnaissance, including the construction uh, and occupation of observation posts, ambushes, counter armor ambushes, defensive tactics, and urban operations. My particular responsibility this time was the live fire tactical training. The planning and conduct of live fire tactical training was incredibly challenging in, in Ukraine in the context we were delivering it. Uh, and this is because, in part, that the Ukrainian live fire procedures and policy um, are incredibly opaque, incredibly difficult to understand, and our confidence in their ability to live fire and conduct that kind of training safely without risk to themselves or to us was justifiably at the time uh, cautious. However, their appetite for risk, uh, by comparison, in my opinion, is significantly better than our own in that they are much more happy to take a lot of risk on sort of risk to life and risk to training. Uh, and in some cases, it gave them and us a lot of freedom to deliver that particular piece of live fire tactical training. For example, you know, we weren't allowed to handle any of the Ukrainian weapons, which is incredibly difficult to deliver marksmanship training when you cannot demonstrate you know, the lessons that you're trying to deliver in theory. Um, you know, for example, the AK-47, but it doesn't work. So fortunately, my platoon sergeant at the time is an immensely successful shot and an excellent shot. Uh, and after we'd secured some sort of permissions to start live firing, put in a demonstration, as you always do after an explanation, uh, demonstrated that it works, and in a nice little competition between us and the Ukrainians, you know, fostering all that good spirit and, and sort of comradeship, we did manage a resounding win um, for the Brits, which is always good. But we had less success with Ukrainian pyrotechnics um, when I managed to blow a hole in the roof of their new classroom uh, instead of tactically illuminating the battlefield. Um, as intended. And I'd actually forgotten that Colonel Lamb was going to be here, um, so I expect a telling off actually, because he expressly said, do not touch those pyrotechnics. <laughs> but there we go. So upon handing over responsibility to the running of Rangers, bear in mind this was us assessing them as instructors to identify you know, the best of their soldiers and instructors who would be able to train efficiently and effectively. Um, we handed over the live fire tactical training to the Ukrainians in order to assess them and for them to gain their qualifications. Uh, and genuinely, genuinely impressed by their attitude towards training, uh, to employing the lessons that we had tried to teach them. They didn't discard them out of hand and sort of revert to what they already knew, which I know that many of us would probably say we're guilty of. Uh, their ability to improvise, control the live fire training, as well as the other lessons across all of those courses that I mentioned. Uh, but in terms of our context, specifically the marked improvement um, that they had in uh, you know, shooting straight. And it sounds really judgmental and perhaps a bit, bit flippant, but it, it's not meant to sound that way. And I think the current situation obviously demonstrates uh, the value of being able to shoot well as both a means of directly killing the enemy, but also, of course, in the tactical use of suppression uh, and deception and maneuver. I genuinely think that in, in my time there in across the courses that I delivered, but across all of the courses that we as Y Company delivered, that the live fire tactical training and the marksmanship uh, was probably the lessons that were most sort of they were most grateful for having received. Um, you could see genuine satisfaction uh, and sort of in their shoot, uh, uh, sort of genuine satisfaction at the improvement of their shooting ability in a matter of weeks after simple lessons, their ability to teach those lessons to their comrades uh, and improve as a whole. And you know, I like to think that it's probably now paying off in quite a big way. So what other lessons did we learn? I think from a personal note, you know, it was a brilliant experience. It's exactly why I joined the army, uh, you know, in the Fusiliers, the opportunity to work overseas with partner nations was very rewarding. The experience of working through interpreters, overcoming national cultural biases to foster relationships, you know, it was a complete thrill. Um, but it doesn't, it's not without its challenges, as I've alluded to. 
um, and there are other things that we can learn. The Ukrainian armed forces are incredibly, or were incredibly, receptive to training and wanted every ounce of experience um, that we could give them. They understood you know, the history of our military and the professionalism and the conflicts we've been involved in. But the, and, and they wanted us to basically just keep teaching lessons over and over, more practical lessons, more instruction, more information. However, obviously the mission brief, as I said, was for us to train them to train others, um, which they were slightly less receptive to. I think that they don't have, or didn't have at the time, a natural learning culture. There is a small cultural stigma attached to making mistakes, uh, and individuals would often try and hide their mistakes or make excuses to cover them up. And it took a lot of time and us adapting our training and the way we were delivering the instruction uh, and understanding their expectations um, in the delivery and assessment of, of this training for both sides to come to terms with it. And it's, you know, it's something that I think still perpetuates. Uh, furthermore, they don't always have a train to fight mentality or that of a sort of train, train hard, fight easy uh, mentality at the time. For example, understanding the importance of light discipline or noise discipline on tactical operations, they absolutely get it on the front line. But the question was always, well, what's the point when it's just during training, which you know, is kind of anathema to how the way we train and how we attempt to do things. Again, cultural biases, the ways of doing things, always going to come into friction, um, but that's part of the mission. Yeah, in my opinion, it was perhaps a mistake of mine and perhaps some of the direction to have as many theoretical elements as we did. I think all they wanted was the practical side, and that's where they were really engaged and really, really capable. Um, and on the theoretical side or the lessons-based side, somewhat less interested. So more time in the field, as is always, you know, the complaint would have been uh, of benefit. And I think personally, uh, you know, on a, on a personal level and on a personality level, the armed forces of Ukraine and the Ukrainians themselves, as has already been said, significantly more generously spirited uh, than I thought they would be, perhaps when in with some of my own biases. They are welcoming, engaged, genuinely interested uh, and curious about our own culture, as in nationally, our military culture and our practices, um, as well as our experiences in, in theatre and our training. Much like us, they are incredibly and fiercely patriotic, immensely proud of themselves as an army, uh, both in their current form and historically. But they are also coming to terms with some of the financial and logistical issues that their army faces or that their, their country faces. They do understand them. They're not burying their heads in the sand as they once did. Um, uh, but they are genuinely passionate about working through or despite this uh, with a view to making things better uh, you know, themselves for their army as they go forward and being immensely pragmatic about the situation. So, during both of those deployments, uh, and I know I'll speak for the other Fusilier companies that deployed, we were able to work alongside some incredibly motivated, especially given the context in which we were training them, but I imagine even more so now, professional and patriotic instructors and soldiers uh, in Ukraine, in the Ukrainian army, looking to develop junior leadership and instructor skills. I think the conclusion that we formed after about six months deployed there working alongside them, that was their reception to training was utterly exemplary, um, and their acknowledgement of needing some kind of progression going forward. They needed to implement some kind of regular training and fixed um, training scheme in order to continually improve their army. I think they got it, and I think they're working towards it. I suspect they'd be much longer, you know, further along the path now um, yeah, had they not been invaded. Naturally, the situation has changed since we were there. Um, I don't think any of us thought the situation that has arised would arise at the time, or has arisen, excuse me. Um, and as is the sad nature of things, you know, a great many of those that we did train at the time, um, both officers and soldiers, uh, have since been killed in operations in the Donbass area and since the invasion began. But it's no doubt their ability, their determination, their patriotism, and perhaps the element, some elements of a paper bear of Russia uh, that have led to their successes so far. But perhaps small elements, uh, I would like to think, um, of success can be attributed to Operation Orbital and the immensely successful delivery of the courses that I think we delivered by the officers and soldiers of the 1st Battalion Royal Regiment Fusiliers. Notably, I think, crucially relating to battlefield casualty drills, I think the, the report we got after the first rotation through was that battlefield casualties had been reduced by 30% by the, by the battalions coming back out of the Donbass area, which is a real tangible effect. 
um, especially anti-armour defence and the counter-sniper mobility and counter-sniper fire. Reports have filtered back that all of those TTPs, those tactics um, that we've been teaching, have been adopted to some extent or another and are being used repeatedly to great effect. Uh, and, you know, it's therefore deeply pleasing, um, both for the British military and the Fusilier side of life, um, and very humbling to have arguably had some kind of tangible effects on the ground uh, in support of the armed forces of Ukraine. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, gentlemen, thank you very much for a fascinating insight into a country we've probably all taken a great interest in and feel significant empathy for over recent months. And a light-hearted view of uh, Keith's 37 seconds of international diplomacy, failed shopping trip and killer dolphins, uh, and Simon's vodka de-escalation doctrine, which I'll <laughs> bear in mind in the future. Uh, and <coughs> finally, Nathan's admitting his own insubordination, which we'll discuss later. Um, uh, but more to the point for his description of the leadership and defensive training we provided, uh, and in particular the establishment of a, uh, of a junior NCO school, uh, which for those of you who are aware of how the British military operates, is, is similar in effect to Brecon and the, and the junior infantry uh, battle school. Um, and finally, Simon, thank you for your honest and brutal reminder of our responsibility to the future of Ukraine uh, post-conflict. At this point, I'd like to invite questions, please. First of all, from anyone in the room. Could you just wait for the microphone so that people online can hear us? Gentlemen, fascinating talk from all three of you. Um, is it just the British Army that are training the Ukrainians, or are there other Western forces uh, doing the same thing, or have they been? And. Uh, if, if there's more uh, individual responsibility being promoted amongst all the off, uh, soldiers rather than taking orders from the top necessarily, um, is that a contrast with the way in which the Russian troops behave? It's a good question. Uh, so it's not just the British, no. I think it's the vast majority of NATO have had instructors or part of their armed forces deployed in some capacity to support operational tools. So. While we were there, we had, well, French officers, Canadians, and the Americans, but I know for a fact that some of the um, other NATO countries, especially Germany, have been out there as well. Um, but each of those courses were delivered independently, so it wasn't a sort of pan-NATO mixed delivery of those courses. In terms of that mission command piece that you talk about, I think it is in stark contrast. I don't know enough to sort of say with complete certainty, but my understanding is, yes, that the, the way the Russians are fighting is still very much of the Soviet area centralized command with very, very little uh, sort of ability or independence of thought on the battlefield from any of the junior leadership. Um, and, you know, and I think it's one way perhaps that the Ukrainians will do as well as they can uh, in that they're starting to employ it. I think they have been starting to employ it probably since, since that changeover from the Soviet area. But it does take a long time. You know, institutional change at that level, I think, is going to take years and years. It doesn't help that they've been rudely interrupted. Does that, does that answer your question? Sorry. Over by the uh, pillar. First, the, uh, the congratulations, and secondly, a question. Uh, I'm a very long, uh, an old ex-commanding officer of the 1st Battalion, and I was uh, hugely proud to hear these three <coughs> these three lectures. Uh, also thanks to Mike Dudding for the, his final uh, lecture as the chair of the memorial uh, committee. Uh, and I'm sure the regiment should be, <coughs> excuse me, I'm sure the regiment should be paying for him for a holiday in Odessa. Um, <laughs> but well done you three boys, Ab absolutely first class and fascinating. My question uh, after those tributes, my question is, and it's possibly a silly question, uh, is the UK doing enough to help Ukraine? Uh, and if not, what should we be doing, both nationally and obviously in this audience, particularly militarily? Um, I'll, I'll respond on the basis that a 
foolish radio station asked me to respond to not similar question, and I'm, I'm not serving, so I can probably be more honest and open than others can be. I would say the United Kingdom has got a very difficult balancing um, judgment to try and, try and make. Um, I will say that we are involved in a war, but we're not at war. It's a difference of a preposition, but it's absolutely crucial. And my understanding is that we are providing everything that we can provide that doesn't, and it's a very difficult judgment, take us over a line where we would be seen to be um, directly involved in the fighting. Um, we are, as I understand it, supporting them in all sorts of different ways through intelligence, logistics, support, ammunition, everything goes with it. So we're doing a huge amount to try and ensure that the Ukrainians continue to defend their country. Um, I think it's rather foolish of some of our politicians um, and to have, have gone one stage further and say they're going, they want to um, defeat Putin and see him removed and everything goes there. I mean, we can all think that, but I think in terms of the messages, it's got to be really clear and straightforward. We are supporting the Ukraine and we will support them all the way to the, to the end. The question is, could we do more? I think you, you get to the stage of saying, um, what more can you do that's not going to tip us into a position where we're directly confronting Putin? And I alluded, I think, in my, my talk to my sense that um, he's marched into a different drum to, to the rest of us. And that is the danger. I don't think we've entirely understood his mindset. He's talked about greater Russia, uh, talking to one of uh, the, the, the friends here this evening, um, the way in which he's used and misused uh, Eastern Orthodox Christianity to justify what he's doing. It's very interesting that a large number of the, um, the uh, Russian soldiers who are fighting uh, are coming from, who are, are not ethnic Russians. They are, they are from minority groups in the, in the East, closer to China than, 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 to, than to there but also very interesting and, and quite telling in terms of the message, the way insofar as we can do any popular polling in, in Russia, um, the suggestion that you know, up to 75% of Russian people fundamentally support what is happening. There is a real, real divide that, that's come down between Russia and the world over their understanding of what's happening in Ukraine. Um, I believe we're correct, I mean, I, and it's not the arrogance of sitting here in, in, in London. I genuinely believe we're correct and they're wrong. But nonetheless, he's managed to persuade the Russian people uh, that the, you know, it's a, uh, a, a, a gang of Nazis and drug addicts that are running Ukraine, uh, and therefore they need to be removed. And he's used every iconic message that the, the Russians can respond to from Mother Russia through to the Third Rome, uh, through to the anti-Nazi fight, all those classic sort of representational things that they've got to try and persuade them. So I think we're in a very difficult place, uh, Patrick. I'm, I'm not sure we could do much more. Um, I have one suggestion, which is we wipe out the Wenger group, get rid of them, clear them off the, off the chessboard, but um, that, you know, out in, in other parts of the world. But for the rest of it, I think it's a very difficult, difficult, um, uh, difficult balance. And I think we're, we, are, we are where we are. I don't think we're going to move much further than that. Um, so, sorry. Yeah, so my question is, um, thank you very much indeed for three really interesting lectures. Thank you very much. Um, so my question is, are you surprised at how resilient the um, Ukrainian army has been? As, you know, quite clearly the Russians, or maybe Putin, is surprised. And why, what would he put it down to? Why are they so resilient? Can you make him? You probably will take that, and then if I can back you up a bit. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, probably exclusively due to Y Company and their deployment to uh, Ukraine, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, I think, uh, I think uh, you know, for what it's worth, personally, yeah, I was very surprised by, by how well they are doing and, and how stiff a resistance they've put up. Um, I would have thought, and I did at the time when the invasion started, that they'd, they'd sort of get steamrolled fairly quickly. And even after the first couple of weeks, I thought, you know, sort of any second now, and yet here we are, you know, even, even many, many weeks later. Um, I think it's as much to do with, and this is perhaps, this is very much the opinion of this author and <laughs> not, not the battalion or, or the British Army, but I think it's perhaps as much to do with Russian sort of inability and a bit of, bit of mismanagement than it is to do with the Ukrainians, as well as they are doing, and as, as stiff resistance as they're putting up, doing the best they can. I think the Russians have drastically mismanaged, in particular, their sort of logistics supplies. Uh, and I think the vast majority, or uh, certainly a lot in the initial stages of the Russian troops, aren't particularly thrilled at having to do what they are doing. Um, that's sort of 
some of the, the sort of feedback I get from some of the Ukrainians that we met uh, and sort of people I know, and, yeah, the, the ink gripes we get. But um, Colonel Land, do you have anything you want to add to that? So the, um, as commanding officer, I've visited uh, Ukraine about seven times. I also visited beforehand with a minister. Um, and the one thing I would say that I think Russia misjudged was the loyalty and the, um, pa uh, the patriotism of the Ukrainian people. They really are a people in their own right. And I don't think that uh, that feeling was understood by the Russians before they did what they did. Uh, and when you face an existential threat and you have that sense of, um, of uh, belief in yourself, then it's amazing what you can do. Thank you very much. Um, it's been three marvelously adjunctive talks to what we read in the newspapers and watch on the screen. But I do feel you have made some omission You've spent a lot of time talking about the vodka for men. Could you talk about what I'm expected to drink if I revisit? <laughs> so so I, I visited Ukraine with a female minister and she was offered vodka and the pork fat to go with it. So I think there are fairly... Um, I think they've got a forward approach to, uh, to, to, to opportunity there. I think they should learn Simon's de-escalation uh, <laughs> policy as well. Uh, anybody else in the room? Uh, yes, just a very quick one. Um, you, you were training people till um, 2020. Uh, was there any training continuing uh, in 2021? And if so, um, up to when before all the terrible I'm tragedies sorry, I, I began? Can't so, so would you, I'm, I'm deaf as a post, probably. So, was there any training conducted after 2020 uh, in Ukraine? 2021. Stop me if I'm wrong. Yeah. 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 Okay. yeah. No, I mean, all, all, all I'm aware of is that the, 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 the last train team was pulled out, I think, in January of this year. Yeah. So, some, tra some training continued, but then the last train team was pulled out. I mean, really, it's, I think when the with intelligence became clear, and it goes back to the, 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 the conversation with, with, with Patrick, that, you know, that the, the, the Russians were coming, sadly. Uh, and so to avoid that clash, well, we pulled our teams out. Oh, so, uh, thank you very much uh, for the presentation, and especially the, what the, the order happened in the recent time on the train team. Uh, obviously, British Army now the focus of our overseas operations, mainly for the short-term training team, uh, cooperate, um, mentoring, and partnering with other partners. And we have been doing it for quite a while and to many different countries. But for example, Afghanistan, to which I have done mentoring out there, uh, the effect isn't like the one that we have in Ukraine. In your opinion, what is the difference that make that uh, some of the training team mission that are more successful than one that is a very horrendous failure, such as Afghanistan? Uh, I, I, I'll start if you want, yeah, and then yeah. hand over. So, so, so the first difference I'd say is, um, when we were training people in Afghanistan, they were in the midst of an insurgency. So we were training troops who were it, fighting at the time, uh, uh, and therefore we were players within an internal conflict. When we were training the Ukrainians, they were not in conflict where we were training them. They were, we were training a conventional army to take part in conventional military operations on the line of contact uh, in uh, the southeast of the country. In Afghanistan, we were effectively training people in the midst of an insurgency to manage that insurgency. And therefore, it, you, comparing the two is a little bit unfair. It, it's a, it's a different circumstance. Yeah, I, I'll, just, I, I'll just reinforce that, I think. And I mean, I, I've had other experiences. I, I had the honor of, of serving in, in, in Oman, and I know uh, Colonel Patrick has done it as well. Um, and there, the conflict part of the Oman at the time, we're talking about sort of 70s, 80s, what it was, that was 
fairly concentrated in one part of the country. So training could, be, could take place out of it and then units could be rotated through it from there. Um, I think trying to do what uh, we had to try and do in Afghanistan and also in Iraq, where you're training while there's con in contact is, is intrinsically much more difficult uh, and much more risky. I don't think that's why the campaign collapsed in Afghanistan, by the way. I mean, I think the challenge in Afghanistan was, was much broader um, in that essentially the Americans had enough and wanted to leave. And even though the British looked at the opportunity or possibility of trying to stay there and trying to put together a sort of coalition the willing, it became very clear that we simply lacked the numbers, the infrastructure and the resources to try and make that work. But without that sort of underpinning of, of Western support, then the Afghan armed forces, despite their courage, despite their bravery, and despite the excellent training they, they, they received, were unable to sustain the offensive, um, which was not entirely led just by the Taliban. I mean, if you want to find out why Afghanistan collapsed, look over the border into Pakistan, look at the role of ISI, look at the role of, 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 of Islamabad, uh, and then you get a better understanding why, uh, why, why Afghanistan fell apart. But, uh, but it's a good conversation, I uh, will come on to that one later. <laughs> Do we have any more questions in the room? Okay, so uh, one question online. Oh, one more question in the room or online? Online, please. Mick, we need the <laughs> microphone. <laughs> this is from James Porter, who's watching on YouTube. History shows us that ammunition stocks are never adequate when battle is joined. Is there a risk that our stocks are being dangerously depleted? I don't think it's appropriate that Nathan or I address this, so no. I'll hand you over. Um, I would say that that's one of the issues that people are looking at at the moment, uh, and particularly given the, the threat that, that uh, Putin has made to the rest of NATO. So amongst the trying to balance, again, this issue of balance, balancing the issue of support to the Ukrainians is also trying to ensure that we have the, the resources in place to defend not just ourselves directly in the UK, but also fulfill our NATO obligations, uh, which is why... Um, again, one of our, well, I say, less well-informed uh, politicians, when she opined that it would be a good idea some of our soldiers went across and, and joined the Ukrainians, was incredibly foolish. Because the, the message to our soldiers is, actually, you've got a proper role to play here. You could well find yourself defending as part of Y Company First Fusiliers or, or you know, in, in, in Estonia or somewhere else. So you know, admire your spirit, admire your courage, got all that bit. But you know, that's you, what you joined up to. You joined up to be soldiers and you serve your country and you serve your country as, you, as you're directed. So and it's, a, it's a close long, long answer to, to James's question. But I would say that those are things that the ministers are trying to balance out at the moment to ensure that we've got the resources we, 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 we need. Uh, the people who are running out of munitions are the Russians, uh, particularly precision guided missiles, which is why we've seen this reversion to you know, Soviet plan A which is hammer everything with as much artillery and, uh, that they can, and rockets they can use, which is crude, dangerous, and is killing lots and lots of civilians to probably very little military effect, uh, because, but they've run, out of, they've run out of precision guided missiles, many of which apparently rely on Western components to make them work, which they haven't got and are not going to get, I hope. Is that it? That's it online. Okay. Uh, thank you once again to the to the three of you, um, but uh, I know that Simon wants to have one last word, if so I, if I, if I we may. will disappear oh, and right, leave you to it. Um, I'm, I'm going to ask for your help. Um, I've got the privilege of being the, the chair of the trustees of the Royal Fusiliers Museum, which is in the, in the, in the Tower of London. Uh, now, I know it's very expensive to come and see our museum, but you do get the, you know, you do get the white tower and the crown jewels thrown in as well, so it's, it's probably worth it for a, for, for a day out. Uh, we've got a marvellous museum, and uh, a couple of the trustees of the museum are here tonight. And my predecessors of chair of trustees have done a fantastic job. But like all museums, particularly now, we now need to uh, evolve. We now need to meet some of the different challenges and ideas that are coming forward. So I'm really going to ask for your help and really do two things. First, announce that we're going to set up something we call the Friends of the, of the Museum, where you know, if, you, if, you're, if you're feeling generous, you, you can look forward to donate them. But actually, what I'm also asking, looking to, to all of you, particularly those who are perhaps still working in, in, in the corporate world, to see whether there are other ways you can come forward and you can help us. Um, so we're looking at issues around you know, developing a digital presence, looking at ways to try and get the, the story of our fusiliers, the eternal fusilier, as, as Jez said, from 1685 right the way through to 
you know, to, to, to Nathan and his friends and, and, and colleagues now uh, and get that story out. And if, if you ever wonder what the eternal fuser is, there were two photographs, which I think we've got up in the museum there. One is of, of, of fuselers in South Amar uh, in, in about 1986. In fact, where's, where's, where, there we are. They're, they're, you're part of your, 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 com your, your company. Uh, so, and they, were, they, were, they are dug in in, in, a, in a hedge completely covered in, 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 in muck and grime, and they're in John Sneesby's company, uh, and they've been there for three days. And, the, and you see there, there's a photograph, they're tired, they're, they're doing their job, but they've got a gut, snaggle tooth, and they look, they look like the proper soldiers look like sometimes. And there's another photograph of a group of Royal Fusiliers in, uh, in a trench in the First World War, and they're the same people. You know, we are the Eternal Fusiliers, and we'd like to take that story, and the whole story, not just the, the brave and the bold, but also, you know, perhaps those who had difficult times with us. We want to tell the whole story of the whole Fusilier, their families, their friends, and get that story out to people because we're not an antiquarian organisation. We're all about living history. We're in a place of memorial itself here today, uh, and we're talking about, you know, uh, one of our predecessor regiments. So if you are inclined, I'm going to be very cheeky and ask that those who, if, you, if I may, uh, I can, we can send out a mailing perhaps to people even who, who are here tonight to tell us a little about the things we're trying to do and spread the word. You know, this is a really important museum to us to tell our story uh, and tell it for not just for this generation but also for new generations to come uh, about our role in our history uh, and the future. So, you know, let's see. It's the Royal Fusiliers, the Fusiliers in London Museum, the Eternal Fusilier Museum uh, in, in the Tower of London and we look forward to your support in the future. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, there's some, some red and white wine at the rear of the um, church and some elderflower juice. Uh, don't forget to donate if possible. <laughs> 